The first thing we should know about food is that for most of the history of passenger shipping, onboard cuisine was terrible. Until the widespread introduction of large-scale refrigeration in the 1880s, passenger ships used to quickly run out of fresh provisions and relied on salted and dried meats, pickled and preserved fruits and vegetables, and baked goods such as hardtack to keep people fed. In the age of sail and even during the early era of the ocean liner, passengers weren't guaranteed a meal aboard, with some shipping lines requiring third class and steerage passengers to bring their own provisions for the long journey. This often had devastating consequences if they didn't bring enough or if the ship was delayed. Today, things are much, much better, and for a large part, we can thank refrigeration for that. In 1877, two French cargo ships successfully carried refrigerated meat across the Atlantic, providing the value of adding refrigeration to ships. By the 1880s, shipping lines were adapting refrigeration for use at sea, which greatly improved the food quality aboard. Today, every cruise ship contains vast spaces of refrigerated storage. These areas are generally located below the waterline and comprise a variety of different storage zones. To visualize what they're like, think of these refrigerated areas like an oversized version of the beer and wine cooling rooms at your local bottle shop. The crew can walk into them and move around, so they're big spaces. Many storage areas even have mechanical equipment to help move large pallets and boxes. Some of the common storage zones include dedicated space for fruit and vegetable storage, milk and dairy chillers, cold storage for champagne, white wine and beer, refrigerated meat storage, egg stores and even a special storage area for caviar on some ships, which is generally kept under lock and key. And don't forget the massive amounts of chocolate which is also stored here. These cold storage areas sit alongside actual freezers, where items that require very low temperatures are kept. Sometimes you can find ice sculptures kept here, which are later used at events such as midnight buffets. Aside from cold storage, there are massive dry storage areas too. Visiting this space feels a bit like an oversized supermarket or big box store, with pallets of cereals, crisps, crackers, soft drink, long life milks, tinned food, tea and coffee as just some of the examples of what you'll find here. These storage areas are linked to the ship's kitchens or galleys, usually by dedicated lifts or elevators, meaning that the items held deep within the hull can be accessed quickly by the food preparation areas near the restaurant. There are also dedicated pathways for the movement of food throughout the ship, allowing for a seamless transition to support the mammoth task of feeding the entire ship and it's all overseen by computer software to ensure that there is an accurate tally of everything that's being consumed. Contrary to popular belief, cruise ships do not bring everything aboard pre-made. Most cruise ships have extensive bakeries, for example, where bread and pastries are made fresh each day. This means that all the ingredients to cook the bread is required in large quantities, including flour and yeast. Similarly, the galleys produce the array of dishes found on the menu, meaning the storerooms contain everything from icing sugar to jelly mix, rice to lobsters, to satisfy the passengers' tastes. So now we know how cruise ships store food, but where does it all come from? If you've been on a cruise, you probably already know the answer. It's all loaded aboard when the ship is in port. For most cruise lines today, the loading of food and provisions is a globally managed system, with a vast supply chain working behind the scenes to ensure each ship is properly provisioned. The food arrives in bulk at the port before the ship arrives, and upon docking, a hive of activity ensures the food is loaded aboard. From the passenger perspective, you'll see this as pallets of consumable items being loaded into the large shell doors. Behind the scenes, a team of specialists work to load the ship with the entire supply chain overseen by the cruise line using advanced monitoring software. This is a far cry from the ways of old, when cruise lines would send a representative ahead of the ship to acquire various fresh provisions in the ports that the ship was visiting. As recently as the 1990s, ships like Cunard, Sagafjord and Vistafjord were renowned for their customizable cuisine thanks to the executive chefs having the discretion to visit local merchants and acquire provisions to add local flair to their planned menus. So just how much food does a ship use? Well, for this example, let's look at Queen Mary II with a gross tonnage of 149,200 and around 2,600 passengers. Each year, the passengers consume enough sugar to make 8 million scones, go through 7,000 boxes of strawberries, and drink enough tea to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's a lot of tea bags. Enough beef is consumed aboard each year 
to supply a city the size of Southampton. And over 8,000 bags of flour is used each year to make all the breads and pastries aboard. They say if you stack them up, the bags would be taller than the Eiffel Tower. And that's just QM2. Imagine the scale on ships with over 5,000 passengers. In just one seven-day cruise, the Oasis class with a gross tonnage of 225,000 are reported to use 6 million coffee beans, 60,000 eggs and 317 kilograms of ice cream. There's even more amazing stats on these ships at cruisefever.net. I'll link it in the description. With such massive quantities of food being required, you can easily understand why the global supply network is needed. This network completely broke down during the pandemic, and I made a video about the chaos that caused, which I've put in the info card and description. So now you know where the food is stored aboard a cruise ship, and how it gets aboard the ship. There is of course a massive environmental and waste burden that comes with this scale of consumption. That's a big topic, best left for another video. So if you're interested in hearing more, let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, I hope to see you on board.